Well, thank you very uh, much for that uh, generous uh, introduction, and, and you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be to be with you all uh, this evening. So, uh, I, uh, uh, as Bob was pointing out, I teach at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, which, uh, as uh, you all know, is in the uh, it's the buckle of the Bible Belt, uh, which uh, creates uh, certain uh, interesting moments uh, in teaching uh, historical approaches toward early Christianity and the New Testament. Uh, this, this last year, I was teaching my course on the New Testament. Uh, so I, I had a class of uh, about 360 students uh, in it. And uh, I, I decided to do something this last year that I had never done before. I, I began my class uh, by asking students the following question said, how many of you in here would agree with the proposition that the Bible is the inspired word of God? Boom! The entire room raises its hand. All right, good, great. Now, uh, how many of you have read the Da Vinci Code, I asked? Boom! The entire room raises its hand. Oh, good, okay. Now, how many of you have read the entire Bible? Scattered hands. <laughs> I said, all right. Now, I'm not telling you that I think God wrote the Bible. You're telling me that you think God wrote the Bible. I can see why you might want to read a book by Dan Brown. <laughs> but if God wrote a book, <laughs> wouldn't you want to see what he had to say? <laughs> uh, it's just one of the mysteries of living in the South. Well, uh, the... Uh, the Bible, the Bible is the most uh, widely purchased, most thoroughly revered, and probably most broadly misunderstood book in the history of human civilization. One of the things that's misunderstood, at least by uh, my 19-year-old students at Chapel Hill, is that when we're reading the Bible, we're not actually reading the uh, words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We're reading translations from the Greek language in which these books were written. And something is always lost in translation. And not only that, but we're not reading translations of the originals of these books because we don't have the originals of these books or of any of the other books of the New Testament. What we have are copies made centuries later, many of them many, many centuries later. These thousands of copies that we have are all different from one another in lots of little ways and sometimes in big ways. There are places where we don't know what the authors of the New Testament originally wrote. Now for some Christians that's not a problem because they don't have a high view of scripture. For others it's a very big problem. What does it mean to say that God inspired the words of the, of the text if we don't have the words? Moreover, why should one think that God performed the miracle of inspiring the words of the Bible if he didn't perform the miracle of preserving the words of the Bible? If he meant to give us his very words, why didn't he make sure we received them? The problem of not having the originals of the New Testament, though, is a problem for everyone, not simply for those who believe that the Bible was inspired by God. For all of us, I think, the Bible is the most important book in the history of Western civilization. It continues to be cited in public debates over gay rights, abortion, over whether to go to war with foreign countries, over how to organize and run our society. But how do we interpret the New Testament? It's hard to know what the words of the New Testament mean if we don't know what the words were. And so in this uh, lecture, I'll be talking about not knowing what the words were and uh, wh what, we might, uh, what we might know about the originals of the New Testament, how they got lost, and how possibly they might be reconstructed. So let me begin by talking about, uh, on a fairly basic level, how it is that we got the books of the New Testament. The books of the New Testament were all written in Greek, they were all written in the first century of uh, the Common Era. Uh, they were written by Greek-speaking Christians who wanted to share with their community their views of Jesus, of the faith, uh, uh, of, of what to believe and how to behave. So an author like Mark, the author of our first gospel, sat down 
and wrote out one day his gospel about Jesus. Now, we don't know where Mark actually lived. Some scholars have thought that Mark maybe lived in Rome. So let's say he lived in Rome. Mark writes his book. Well, how does this book get in, into circulation? The problem is we're dealing with an age in which uh, there were no Xerox machines. Uh, there wasn't desktop publishing yet, no PDF files. Uh, in fact, uh, there wasn't carbon paper. How did people copy? How did people get copies of books? Well, in the ancient world, the only way to get a copy of a book was to copy it by hand. One page, one sentence, one word, one letter at a time. Mark makes his book, and somebody in his community wants another copy of it. And so that person either makes a copy himself or has somebody else make a copy for him. Now, part of the problem is that in the ancient world uh, at this time period in the Roman Empire, probably something like 90% of the population was illiterate, couldn't read or write. So not anybody could just make a copy. And, and most people who could write couldn't write very well. And so somebody makes a copy. We don't, know who it, we don't know who it was who made the first copy. We don't know if this person was competent or incompetent, but he made a copy. And probably, if he made a copy of this book by hand, one page, one sentence, one, one word, one letter at a time, he made mistakes. Now, my students sometimes have difficulty believing that people make mistakes when they copy things by hand. And so I tell them, well, you know, you sit down tonight and copy the Gospel of Mark and see how you do. Uh, well, in fact, they'll make mistakes. Now, here... Here we have a problem created because we have the second copy of Mark that is also put in circulation and somebody wants a copy of Mark and so they copy the copy, but the copy has mistakes in it. And so the next person who copies it copies the mistakes thinking that they're the original wording. And the second person also makes mistakes of his own. And so he not only reproduces the mistakes of his predecessor, he introduces his own mistakes. And then another person comes along and copies that copy, making the mistakes of both of his predecessors and creating mistakes of his own. And then that book gets put, put in. And pretty soon you've got copies around the city of Rome that are all different from one another. Now a visitor comes to Rome from Ephesus, and uh, they have a church back in Ephesus too, and they want a copy of this gospel, and so he takes a copy, makes a copy, takes it back to Ephesus. And then that copy gets copied, and that copy gets copied, and that copy gets copied, then somebody comes from Smyrna, and they want a copy. And so, and so it goes, for year after year after year. We don't have a copy of Mark until around the year 200 about 150 years after Mark was originally written. So not only do we not have the originals, we don't have the first copies, or the copies of the copies, or the copies of the copies of the copies of the copies, etc., etc. Mistakes were made en route, and these mistakes were replicated. Now, the only way a mistake gets corrected is if you're copying a copy of Mark, and you come across a sentence that you're pretty sure is wrong because it doesn't make sense, and you try and correct it. And so you, uh, you, you, you correct it to say something other than what it says. The problem is there's no guarantee that you will correct the mistake correctly, right? You might correct the mistake incorrectly, in which case you've got three forms of the text, the original text, the mistake, and the mistaken correction of the mistake. And so it goes on for year after year, decade after decade. The originals end up getting lost. They get lost, they're either, they're either worn out of existence or people figure, well, we don't need this, I've got a brand new copy of it, and so they throw it away. And all of, the, all of the books of the New Testament, all 27 books, experience the same fate. And so that is the situation we're dealing with. This is not a situation that's unique to the New Testament. This is a situation that we find for every book from the ancient world. Every ancient book has this problem. The problem is exacerbated with the New Testament simply because the New Testament has come to be revered as scripture and also because, as it turns out, we have more copies of the New Testament than of any other book uh, from the ancient world. That would seem like a good thing, but it also means that we have more mistakes for the New Testament than for any other book. And so uh, the uh, abundance of evidence we have creates an abundance of problems. Let me talk about the surviving copies that we do have. Uh, first, give you a sense of the numbers uh, of books that we're talking about. New Testament was originally written in Greek, and at last count we had over 5,700 copies. 
of the New Testament uh, in the Greek language in which it was originally written. Now, when I say we have 5,700 copies, I don't mean that we have complete copies of all the books from beginning to end. What I mean is we have either complete copies or fragmentary copies. Some of these fragmentary copies are very small little fragments found in trash heaps in Egypt uh, that where the rest of the book was destroyed, and we just have a little scrap. Uh, so we have from little scraps to enormous tomes that are in, in uh, medieval libraries, we have 5,700 copies in Greek, and we have copies in other languages, because as Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire, people translated the New Testament into other languages, such as Latin. Uh, we have something like 10,000 copies of the Bible in, in the New Testament in Latin, uh, in Coptic, the ancient Egyptian language, in Syriac, in, uh, in Georgian, in Armenian, in Old Church Slavonic, etc., etc. We have all sorts of copies in all sorts of languages. Uh, these, uh, these copies uh, can be compared with one another, and when you compare these copies with one another, there are lots of mistakes in them because no two of these copies are exactly alike in their wording. How old are these copies that we have? Well, uh, the oldest copy that we have of any book of the New Testament is actually a little fragment that was discovered in Egypt. This fragment is um, about the size of a credit card, and it's written on both front and back. Uh, that's significant, by the way, that it's written on both front and back, because it tells you that this copy actually came from a book uh, like we have books today where you've got pages written on front and back as opposed to a scroll. Christians early on preferred writing their, their scriptures in books rather than in scrolls. That made uh, these books different from other books throughout the, the Roman world. This little credit card sized scrap that we have is called P52. <laughs> it's called P52 because it's written on papyrus so P, papyrus is an ancient writing material, and it's called P52 because it was the 52nd papyrus that was discovered and, and, and categorized, classified, um, um, cataloged. So uh, this little scrap has a few lines on it from John chapter 18. It's the passage where Jesus is talking to Pontius Pilate uh, in his trial before Pilate, where Pilate says, what is, tr what is truth? That line. Uh, so that's that. It's written on, and it's written both front and back. Now the thing is, if you have a little scrap like that, and it's written on the front and the back, and you know what passage it comes from, uh, then you can actually do some interesting things because you can figure out, even though you don't have a complete line on this page, you can figure out where this thing was on the page, and if you've got. Um, if you do it right, if you figure out, if you've got it one margin, you can figure out how many letters were in each line, and you can figure out how many lines must have been on the page in order to get from this part to that part. See what I'm saying? So you can actually reconstruct how long the page was, and then you can calculate how many pages were in this manuscript, because how many pages would it take with this many letters in it to, to create the Gospel of John? And so this one scrap can tell you how long the manuscript was. Uh, so there are people who do this for a living, <laughs> so it turns out. <laughs> So this is the oldest scrap. How old is it? This scrap, P52, uh, is usually dated to the first half of the second century. The way they date uh, ancient manuscripts is actually on the basis of a handwriting analysis. Uh, the, the, the science of this is called paleography. Paleo meaning ancient, graphy meaning writing, ancient writing. So the study of ancient writing is called paleography. And there, there are scholars who are paleographers who can date manuscripts within about 50 years of their production. Uh, the, the, the way the, the science works is that handwriting in the ancient world before there was the invention of printing changed slowly over time. So people made letters in certain distinctive ways depending on when they lived. Uh, and so if you are familiar with how handwriting was in different periods of history, then you can determine when, when a manuscript was written. That's, that's the science of paleography. And you can, a good paleographer can get within about 50 years. So this thing, and you need a 50 year gap because some scribe who's copying a manuscript when he's 70 uh, probably is writing the same way he did when he learned how to write when he was 20, and so you need a 50-year you need a 50 year, 50 year gap. So this thing is dated to around 125 plus or minus 25 years. Well, that's pretty early. This is from the Gospel of John. This, is, this, this little piece was probably written about 30 or 40 years after John itself had been produced. So that, that's pretty good. We don't get a complete copy of the Gospel of John uh, until, again, around the year 200. Uh, but we do have this, this little scrap. Uh, 
Most of the manuscripts we have are not anywhere near this early, though. Uh, we start getting full manuscripts at the beginning of the 3rd century, around the year 200, 150, 170 years after Jesus' death. Uh, these are about 120 years after most of these books had been written. Uh, and we don't, don't start getting numerous manuscripts until the 7th, 8th, or 9th centuries. Uh, and then we start getting lots of them because then you've got monasteries where monks are spending their days copying manuscripts. Uh, and we have, we have a lot of their manuscripts. And so 5,700 manuscripts, some of them going back into the second century, none of them being uh, the originals or within uh, a few, even within a few years of the originals. So with, with all of these differences, with, with all of these manuscripts, how many differences are there? Throughout the Middle Ages, it appears that the scholars didn't realize that there was a problem of not having the original text, or very few scholars uh, realized that this was a problem. Even the scribes copying the text, they, they sometimes would realize there were differences in the manuscripts they were copying, but they didn't make a very big deal about it. The first time somebody made a really big deal about this was uh, exactly 300 years ago this year, in the year 1707. There was a, there was a scholar, uh, named John Mill at Oxford. I, I think he's unrelated to the Victorian John Stuart Mill. Uh, th this John Mill was a, uh, was a scholar of, of the Bible. And he had spent 30 years looking at manuscripts of the, uh, of the New Testament. Now, this is obviously after the invention of printing. And printers have to decide what text they're going to print. And the problem is they've got manuscripts that have differences among them. And so how does a printer decide which manuscript to print? Well, it's a problem. That, that's when they started realizing that this was an issue. Well, John Mill wanted to produce a printed edition of the Greek New Testament. He spent 30 years looking at the manuscripts available to him. He had available to him 100 manuscripts, approximately 100 manuscripts. And he printed up his edition of the Greek New Testament in which he'd give, he'd give a verse... And then at the bottom of the page, he would indicate the places where the manuscripts differed from one another for, for that verse. To the shock and dismay of many of his readers, when John Mill produced his edition of the Greek New Testament, it included an apparatus at the bottom of the page that cited 30,000 places where the manuscripts differed from one another. 30,000 places where there were manuscript variations among the manuscripts that he had discovered. And the striking thing is John Mill didn't give all of the differences he found. He only cited the differences that he thought were significant. Some of his detractors claimed that John Mill was working to render the text of Scripture uncertain. His supporters pointed out that he didn't create these differences. <laughs> he simply noticed that they exist. So what do we know today about the numbers of mistakes in our manuscripts? Well, Mill looked at 100 manuscripts, and now we have 5,700 manuscripts. Nobody knows how many differences there are among the manuscripts. Uh, that we now have, because nobody yet, even with the development of computer technologies, nobody has been able to add up all of the differences. Sometimes uh, scholars guess that there may be a couple hundred thousand differences. Some people say 300,000, some say 400,000. Uh, there are different guesses. The way I usually put it to my students is in, in comparative terms. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. Well, this obviously creates a problem. If you want to know what Mark actually said, and all you've got are copies of Mark that are hundreds of years later that have so many differences in them, how can you possibly reconstruct it? Well, that, that, that is a problem. <laughs> Now, having said that we have these hundreds of thousands of differences, I, I want to, to emphasize a particular point, which is most of these differences that we have in our manuscripts are completely insignificant, unimportant, and don't matter for a thing. Many of these differences in the manuscripts are so unimportant that you can't replicate them in translation. Okay? In other words, you, like they change the word order. Uh, in Greek, where you'd have to translate the same way no matter what the Greek word order is. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter very much. By far, the vast majority of these hundreds of thousands of differences are significant for nothing more than showing that scribes in antiquity could spell no better than my students can today. <laughs> and scribes, of course, didn't have spell check. 
Uh, scribes, in fact, didn't even have dictionaries. And scri m many scribes didn't care how they spelled anything. Sometimes you'll be reading a manuscript and there'll be the same word that occurs, say, three times within a couple of lines, and the scribe will spell the same word three different ways. He just doesn't care how the word is spelled. Well, so, you know, you've got, you've got lots and lots of those kinds of changes, and what do they matter for? They don't matter at all. So, having said there are all these hundreds of thousands of differences, I want to stress that most of them don't matter for very much. Some of these, some of these changes, the ones that don't matter, basically, are accidental mistakes. Scribes were uh, sometimes tired or sleepy, uh, sometimes they were distracted, sometimes they were inept or unqualified, and they made mistakes. They would leave out a word, they'd leave out a, a verse, sometimes they'd leave out a page. Uh, they, they just made mistakes sometimes. One of the common mistakes uh, of scribes is actually kind of interesting. Uh, there, sometimes, you know, in the New Testament you'll have a, a saying where you'll have two lines that end with the same words. Like Jesus in, John, in Luke chapter 12 says that whoever confesses me before people will be confessed before the angels of heaven and whoever denies me before people will be denied before the angels of heaven. So you've got two lines that end with the words before the angels of heaven. And what scribes sometimes would do is they'd copy down the words before the angels of heaven on the first occurrence, and then you know, they'd copy it down, then their eye would go back to the page, and their eye would alight on the second occurrence of the same words. Thinking that that's what they had just copied, they'd go then to the next line and start copying there, and as a result, they would leave out the intervening line. See how that works? That kind of, that kind of phenomenon is a, it's an, where your eye skips from one line to another. It's, it's called parablepsis. Parablepsis. And when you have words that end a line the same way, that, that's known as homoeoteluton. <laughs> so this kind of mistake is called parablepsis occasioned by homoeoteluton. <laughs> it's on my final exam at Chapel Hill. <laughs> Probably the most egregious mistake in any manuscript of the New Testament, uh, one of my favorites, is uh, in a manuscript that's manuscript 109. It's 109 because it's, it's written on parchment and it, uh, you know, le uh, animal skin instead of papyrus, and it was uh, it's the 109th manuscript that was, uh, that was uh, cataloged. This is a 10th century manuscript that was written by a scribe who wasn't paying attention. Uh, and this, uh, this scribe was uh, copying the Gospel of Luke, now, the Gospel of Luke uh, is one of the two Gospels in the New Testament that has a genealogy of Jesus. Genealogies usually aren't the favorite reading of my students at Chapel Hill. And I think probably it wasn't the favorite reading of this guy because he wasn't really paying attention to what he was doing. But, you know, in Luke's genealogy, Luke's genealogy is actually fairly interesting because... Uh, in, in Math, Matthew's the other gospel that gives a genealogy of Jesus, and it traces Jesus' line all the way back to Abraham, the father of the Jews, in Matthew. Luke doesn't stop there. Luke keeps going. Luke traces Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Adam, as in Adam and Eve. <laughs> This is a fantastic genealogy. I've got an aunt who's a genealogist who's traced my family you know, back to the Mayflower. The Mayflower, Adam and Eve. So, so it's, you know, Jesus is supposedly the son of Joseph, who's the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, who's the son of David, son of Jesse, son of so-and-so, goes all the way back. You know, Isaac, son of Abraham, so on, back to uh, you know, Seth, son of Adam, who's the son of God. Okay, this genealogy it goes all the way back. So, the scribe of manuscript 109 is copying a manuscript that evidently gave the genealogy in two columns. Two columns. But the second column didn't go to the bottom of the page. It only went part way down, the second column. So, the first column, second column, part way down. And the scribe apparently didn't realize that this genealogy was in two columns. And so he copied across the columns instead of copying one column, then the other column, leading to some very interesting results. <laughs> As it turns out, Adam isn't the first human being. There's, there, there was a man named Pharees, who's the father of the human race, and, and as it turns out, God is the son of Aram. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it happens. <laughs> These kinds of mistakes are just pure accidental mistakes that you know, scribes mess up in places. There are other kinds of mistakes uh, 
that um, are uh, what, what I think are probably intentional mistakes. I, I, call, I differentiate between accidental mistakes where scribes just slip up and intentional mistakes where it looks like scribes are actually trying to change the text. Now, I don't know for sure that scribes are trying to change the text. I don't have any scribes around to interrogate about the matter. But there are some changes that don't look like they could possibly simply be a slip of the pen. Let me, and there are others that are debatable, whether they're a slip of the pen or, or not. But let me give you a couple of examples, and you'll see that some of these look like scribes maybe wanted to change the text. I'll give you a, I'll give you a couple of for instances. In Mark chapter 1, the Gospel of Mark, uh, we read at the very beginning that uh, we read, as was written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face to prepare your way for you. Okay, this is in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before you. This is a very interesting passage because the passage that's quoted is not Isaiah. When it says in Isaiah the prophet and then gives the quotation, the passage quoted is actually Exodus. So it's interesting that in uh, the later manuscripts of uh, Mark's gospel, the text is changed. Not to, so that it no longer says in Isaiah, as is written in Isaiah the prophet, now it says, as is written in the prophets. You see, getting rid of the problem that in fact this isn't a quotation from Isaiah. Right? See, so that, I mean, maybe that's a slip of the pen, but it looks to me like somebody saw that this could be taken as a mistake and they changed it as a result. Or give you, give you a second example. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, we have the only story of Jesus as a boy in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus is a 12-year-old, and we're told that he and his family have taken a trip to Jerusalem to celebrate a festival, probably the Passover festival. Uh, this, it is a peculiar story because the, uh, the, they, they celebrate this festival, and then the family gets back, goes back in the caravan back home, and three days later they realize Jesus isn't with them. <laughs> I mean, you, you might think they would have checked ahead of time, but they, he's not there, and so they go back to Jerusalem to try and find him, and on the third day, his mother finds him in the temple. And this isn't an accident, by the way, that it's on the third day, right? This is, this is a foreshadowing for Luke of what's going to happen at the resurrection narrative, where on the third day, Jesus will rise from the dead. Well, so on the third day, his mother finds him in the temple, uh, and there's 12-year-old Jesus talking to the leaders of, of the, the Jews and discussing with them matters of the law, and Mary uh, is not pleased, and she sees Jesus finally after tracking him down for three days, and she says, son, why have you done this? Your father and I have been looking all over for you. Now, when scribes copied this, they, they were taken aback. Your father and I? But Joseph wasn't his father, right? Jesus was born of a virgin. So it doesn't make sense for Mary to say, your father and I have been looking all over for you. And so there are changes in the manuscripts. Some manuscripts simply say, Joseph and I have been looking all over for you. Some manuscripts say, we have been looking all over for you. But somebody's changing the, man changing the text because it could be read as a problem. And so they got, they got rid of the problem. I'll give you a third example. Uh, this example uh, is in one of Jesus' uh, discourses in the New Testament in uh, Matthew chapter 24, in which Jesus is talking about what's going to happen at the end of time. Uh, <laughs> this passage actually was very important. I'm, I, I, feel, I feel a tangent coming on here, by the way. <laughs> this passage was very important uh, when I moved to uh, Chapel Hill in 1988. Uh, this, Bob, you had, you had been gone for a year at this time. In 1988, there was a big furor in North Carolina. Uh, there, were, there, was a, there were Christian groups who thought that the end of the world was going to happen in 1988. Uh, that Jesus was going to come back and take everybody out of the world who, had, who were his followers. Uh, that's the rapture, right? When everybody, the rapture and Jesus comes back, takes people out of the world, and then the, all hell breaks out on earth for seven years, and then the end comes, right? So, so there was a guy who had written a book based on this passage I'm going to talk about in a second. A guy had written this book uh, that was called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Occur in 1988. This, this book was in two million copies. I had students whose parents believed it and literally sold the farm. They, they thought that, that Jesus was going to come back 
in 1988. And so I just showed up in North Carolina, kind of blissfully ignorant of these things. And uh, uh, you know, I moved from New Jersey, <laughs> where such things we're not worried about. And we, um, uh, but this guy, this guy named Edgar Weissenet, he, he was a he was a NASA engineer who uh, had, had studied the Bible and come up with 88 reasons why the rapture is going to occur in 1988. And one of the reasons involves this passage I'm going to talk about. Je Jesus tells this passage, the, the disciples want to know when's the end going to come. And Jesus tells them, learn the parable of the fig tree. When the fig tree puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So too, when these things take place, you know that the end is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. So uh, Edgar Weissen, this is one of Edgar Weissenden's 88 reasons. So the way it works is this. Uh, what is Israel in the Bible? Israel is sometimes represented as a fig tree. Well, when the fig tree puts forth its leaves, you know that the end is near. Well, okay, so if, if the fig tree is Israel, when does, when does the fig tree put forth its leaves? Well, the, the fig tree lies dormant over the winter, and then when springtime comes, it comes back to life. When does Israel come back to life? 1948. That's when Israel comes back to life, becomes a nation again. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. How long is a generation in the Bible? Forty years. 1948 plus 40, bingo, 1988. This was one of the 88 reasons. Now, somebody pointed out to Edgar Weissen that Jesus in the same passage points out that no one knows the day or the hour when the end will come. Uh, when Weissen had said that it was going to come during the week of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, in September. And so they said, but you know, Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour. And Weissman was completely unfazed. He said, I don't know the day or the hour. I just know the week. <laughs> All right. So, so th this passage actually throughout Christian history has been, been important because people have always been trying to figure out when the end's going to come. So, uh, in this passage, Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour, not the angels of heaven, nor even the sun, but the Father alone. Okay, Matthew 24, 36. Scribes copying that found it uh, to be a peculiar thing to say, though. Not even the Son knows when the end is going to come. I mean, surely the Son of God is all-knowing. Isn't he omniscient? And so how do scribes deal with the problem? They deal with the problem by getting rid of the phrase. And so in later manuscripts, the phrase, not even the Son, is taken out so that now Jesus doesn't claim to be ignorant about when the end is going to come. So that's, and that strikes me as probably an intentional sort of change. All right, so you get, you get accidental changes and you get intentional changes. I want to talk about some of the big differences that you get in some of our manuscripts just, to, just so you can get an idea of, of, uh, of how significant this problem can be. Probably the uh, most familiar story in the New Testament Gospels is the story of Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. I'm pretty sure this is the best known story of the Gospels because it's in all the Hollywood movies. I mean, if, if you do a movie about Jesus, you've got to have Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. It's so much a requirement that even Mel Gibson, who uh, the Passion of the Christ, which is about Jesus' last hours, has to get this in, and so he has a flashback showing this, this, this scene of uh, Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. So the way the story works, it's, it's found only in the Gospel of John, chapter 7 and 8. And Jesus is teaching the temple, and the Jewish leaders bring, they drag this woman in front of him, and they say, she's been caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says we're to stone someone like this. What do you say? See, this is setting a trap for Jesus, because if Jesus says, well, yeah, stone her, then he's violating his teachings of love and mercy. But if he says, no, forgive her, then he's breaking the law of Moses. So what's it going to be? Well, uh, Jesus has his way of kind of getting out of these traps, as you know, if you, if you read the New Testament. So what he does in this case is he, he stoops down and he starts riding on the ground. And he looks up and he says, let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her stoops back down, starts writing again, and one by one, feeling guilt of their own sins, they, they begin to leave until Jesus looks up again and there's no one left. And he says to the woman, is there no one left to condemn you? 
And she says, no, Lord, no one. Jesus replies, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Um, there is a textual variant in a now lost manuscript, which when um, Jesus, uh, about this, this line about let the one, when he says, let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. And this one textual variant, uh, it indicates that a stone comes flying out from the crowd, nails the woman in the head. And Jesus says, mom, sometimes you really tick me off. I made that up. <laughs> this, this story, uh, th this beautiful story, this powerful story, uh, which uh, has two terrific lines uh, from Jesus in it, this story was not originally in the Gospel of John. This is a story that was added to the Gospel of John by later scribes. How do I know that? We have a number of early manuscripts of the Gospel of John. This story is not found in any of our early or best manuscripts of the Gospel of John. The Greek authors who wrote commentaries on the Gospel of John over the centuries don't mention this story until the 10th century, a thousand years after the days of Jesus. Uh, the writing style of this story, if you read it in Greek, the writing style is a completely different writing style from the writing style of the rest of the Gospel of John. As a result, scholars have known for years that this story did not originally belong in the Gospel of John. Well, why is it in our English Bibles then? Probably what happened was some scribe had heard this story. They'd heard the story and they decided that it illustrated some of the teachings in John chapter 7. And so they, they wrote out the story in a margin. A second scribe came along, saw the story in the margin, and thought it belonged in the text, and then wrote his manuscript by putting the story in the text. Another scribe comes along and copies that manuscript, and that manuscript gets copied, and so on until it becomes part of the textual tradition. And it's these later manuscripts that were used by the translators of the King James Bible in 1611 so that the story came into English uh, through the King James Bible. So um, this story, however, uh, is not a story that was originally in the New Testament. So people sometimes ask me, well, are there any changes that are significant in the New Testament? Well, yeah, well, this strikes me as a rather significant change that the story of the woman taken in adultery wasn't originally there. Or consider a second instance of another big difference, the Gospel of Mark. Mark is probably my favorite gospel because it's so subtle and understated in places, and it, it, it says things that you don't expect. Uh, and nowhere is this more true than in the ending of Mark's gospel. In Mark's gospel, Jesus is uh, put on trial, and he's crucified, he's dead, he's buried. And on the third day, the women go to the tomb. The tomb is empty, and Jesus is not in it. There's some man in there. And the man tells the women that Jesus is not here. He's been raised from the dead. You, he tells the women, go tell the disciples that he will meet them in Galilee. And then it says the women fled from the tomb and they didn't say anything to anyone for they were afraid. Period. That's where it ends. That's the end of the Gospel of Mark. And you think, ay, yeah, yeah, how could it end there? <laughs> I mean, they're told to tell the disciples, but they don't tell anybody. Didn't the disciples ever learn? Didn't they go to Galilee? Didn't they see Jesus? How could that be the end of the story? And that's exactly the reaction the scribes had. They got to that ending, they said, ay, yeah, yeah, how could it end there? <laughs> and scribes then decided it couldn't add there, and so they added 12 verses. So that in your English Bibles today, you'll find 12 more verses after that, chapter, uh, after chapter 16, verse 8. And often they'll be in double brackets because the translators are t will tell you in a footnote, these verses weren't originally in here. These were added by later scribes. In these verses, uh, in these added verses, the scribes added later, uh, but we know they're added later because they're not in the earliest and best manuscripts. The writing style is different from the rest of the Gospel of Mark. And in fact, there are, uh, there are inconsistencies between this ending and the, the verses that precede it. So this is clearly an addition to the Gospel of Mark. In these final verses, according, according to these final verses, the women do go tell the disciples. The disciples do go to Galilee. They do meet Jesus there. And Jesus then tells them that they're to make the disciples of all the nations. And people become his disciples will be able to speak in foreign languages that they previously didn't know. They'll be able to handle deadly snakes. And they'll be able to drink poison and it won't harm them. <laughs> 
These are the verses that the Appalachian snake handlers in my part of the world use to base their liturgical practices on. I've always thought that sometime on the, on, you know, in, the, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, somebody should point out, well, you know, actually those verses aren't in the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, Mark actually ends with women not saying anything to anyone, for they were afraid. Somebody added the last 12. Uh, let me give you a couple more examples of some differences that strike me as big. One, one that I, I think is really quite interesting, the scholars debate. The, the first two I gave you, the scholars don't debate very much. Almost everybody agrees that they weren't originally there. But there, there's an interesting change in another story in Mark that there's, there are, there's a lot of debate about among scholars. It's, it's a story in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus heals a leper. And the way the story works is that Jesus is, uh, is walking along and a leper comes up to him. And the leper says to him, so I mean, this is you know, this guy with leprosy. And he comes up to him and he says, uh, Lord, if you're, you're willing, you're able to, to cleanse me. And in most manuscripts, it says that Jesus felt compassion for the man. And he reached out his hand and he said, I am willing. And he healed him. But in several ancient manuscripts, it says something different. In these other manuscripts, instead of saying Jesus felt compassion for the man, it says, and Jesus got angry and reached out his hand and said, I am willing, be cleansed. Getting angry. Now, scholars have to debate which is the text that Mark originally wrote and which is the text that's been changed by a scribe. And one, one piece of logic that, that scholars have used over the years is this. Ask yourself, which text is a scribe more likely to have created out of the other? Is a scribe likely to have taken the text that says Jesus felt compassion and changed it to say Jesus got angry? Or is a scribe likely to have found the text that said Jesus got angry and to change it to say Jesus felt compassion? Well, if you put it like that, then, well, the latter's more, more likely something a scribe would have changed. And so this criterion ends up sounding kind of backwards, but the way the criterion works is that the reading that's the most difficult to understand is probably the original one, okay? The more difficult reading is to be preferred. And so that's one reason for thinking that, in fact, this text originally said Jesus got angry, and there are actually a whole host of reasons for thinking that's what the text said. The next... The next step then is to ask, well, what's he angry about? In other words, you, to, to try and figure out what the text means. But you can't know what the text means unless you know what the text says. You see? So you've got to establish the words first, and that's what people who are textual critics do. They try and decide what the words originally were. Let me give you one other example, and then I'm going to stop and take, uh, take any questions that you have. Um, there's another uh, quite moving passage in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, which uh, is, is also well known. It, it's, at, it's, a, it's a scene in which Jesus is being, uh, being crucified. And uh, Luke is interesting in the, in the scene of Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, Luke is interesting at the scene of the crucifixion because uh, it's unlike what happens in... Luke is unlike what happens in Mark's gospel, the, the story of, of the crucifixion. In Mark's... Just to, just to illustrate this for a second, in Mark's gospel which is the first gospel, you have a very distinct uh, portrayal of Jesus going to his crucifixion, a portrayal that is filled with pathos and, and agony. Uh, people don't realize this, that Mark's portrayal is very different from Luke's portrayal. And the reason they don't see that there are differences is because of the way that people read the gospels. Uh, the, the way people typically read the Gospels, if they read the Gospels at all, but if, the, if they read the Gospels, the, the normal way of reading a Gospel is you start at the beginning and you read to the end. So, okay, you're going to read the Gospel. You start with Matthew. You start with the first verse, chapter 1, verse 1, and you, you start reading and you get to the end. You go from top to bottom. Then you read Mark. Start with the beginning, go to the end, top to bottom, and it sounds a lot like Matthew. Same stories, a lot of the same words, sounds very similar. Then you read Luke, top to bottom, sounds exactly the same. Not exactly, it's different, but it, you know, it's basically the same thing. They sound alike. And then you read John, well, that's different, but, well, you know, in essence, it's, it's not that far off. So they all sound basically the same because you read them from top to bottom, or you read them vertically. The way to see differences in the Gospels is to read them not vertically, but to read them horizontally where you read a story in Matthew and you look at the same story in Mark and compare the, compare the two stories. When you do that, you start finding enormous differences. Uh, people, you know, there are all these debates about whether there are discrepancies in the Bible. But if you want to find discrepancies in the Bible, all you have to do is, 
is read the text horizontally. I give, I give this as an assignment to my students all the time. Uh, I give them the path. I say, take the resurrection accounts. What really happened at the resurrection? Depends which author you read. And so I have them list what happens in Matthew, what happens in Mark, what happens in Luke, what happens in John, and, uh, and compare the list. And it's actually quite striking when you do this with the resurrection narratives. Because, well, who, who is it that goes to the tomb? Is it Mary Magdalene by herself or Mary with other women? If other women, how many other women? And what are their names? It depends which gospel you read. What do they find there? Is the stone rolled away already or is it not rolled away uh, already? Depends which gospel you read. What do they, who do they see there? Do they see a man there as in Mark? Do they see two men there as in Luke? Or do they see an angel as in Matthew? Depends which gospel you read. What are they told? Are they told to tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee, or are they told to tell the disciples to stay in Jerusalem? Do they go tell the disciples? It depends whether you read Mark or whether you read Matthew and Luke. If they do tell the disciples, what do the disciples do? Do they go to Galilee, or do they stay in Jerusalem? It depends which gospel you read. I mean, you just, you just go down the line, and, it, and, it's, and it's different. And that's how you get if you, if you read these stories against each other. Well, if you do that in the story of the crucifixion in Mark and Luke, you come up with very, very different portrayals. The significance of that, the significance of that is not just, that, oh, okay, it's, well, there are discrepancies. Yeah, there are discrepancies, but that isn't the point. The point is that if you want to know what Mark has to say, you have to read Mark and not pretend he's saying the same thing as Luke because they're different. And so Mark has to stand on its own as a literary production. In Mark's gospel, when Jesus is being crucified, uh, in fact, it's a, it's a very gripping scene. In Mark's gospel, Jesus doesn't say anything uh, while he's being led to the place of crucifixion. While he's being crucified, he's completely silent. When he's hanging on the cross, he's mocked by uh, the Jewish leaders by the people who are passing by in front of him. He's mocked by both robbers in Mark's gospel. Jesus doesn't say anything until the end in Mark's gospel. At the end, he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. That's it. That's Mark. A very, very powerful and gripping. And, but people don't realize that this, because people think Jesus said all sorts of other things on the cross. Well, why do they think that? Because they've read Matthew, and they've read Luke, and they've read John, and they end up with the seven last words of the dying Jesus, which are found in not one of the Gospels, but by smashing all of the Gospels together into one big, big Gospel. Now, it's perfectly legitimate to do that if you want to do that. If you want to read the Gospels and smash them all together so they're all right and they're all saying the same thing, but you have to realize that if you're doing that, you're writing your own Gospel, and you're making it say something that's different from any of the Gospels of the New Testament. Okay, so I mean, that, that's the effect of doing that. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is not silent. He's not silent on the way to be crucified. He sees women weeping for him, and he, and he turns to them, and he says, uh, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the fate that's to befall you. He's more concerned about these women than himself in Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, he's not quiet while he's uh, being nailed to the cross. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. While he's hanging on the cross, he actually has an intelligent conversation with one of the robbers. The one guy accuses, the one guy maligns Jesus. The other robber says to the other person to, to, to be quiet because Jesus hasn't done anything to deserve this. And then he turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus knows exactly what's happening to him in Luke's gospel. Not in Mark, but in Luke, he knows exactly what's happening to him. He knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. He's going to wake up in paradise, and this guy's going to be next to him. And at the end, the most telling thing of all is that Jesus, instead of crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't say that in Luke. What he says is, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And he dies. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is completely in control of the situation. He knows what's going on. He knows why it's going on, unlike Mark, where he seems to be in doubt. This, passage, this verse about, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, is a very interesting verse. In early Christianity, this verse was interpreted not as a prayer of forgiveness for the Romans who were crucifying him. It was interpreted as a prayer for the Jews who had turn Jesus over to the authorities. Jesus is asking for forgiveness for the Jewish people in the interpretation of the early Christian interpreters of the passage. 
That makes it striking that in some manuscripts from uh, the early dec and from the er from the early years, this prayer is omitted by some scribes. Why would scribes take that lovely verse out? Bec well, it should be obvious why they took it out. They took it out because they interpreted it as a prayer of forgiveness for Jews, and these scribes didn't think God had ever forgiven the Jews. In the second and third centuries, Christians started saying that Jews are guilty for the killing of Christ and that, in fact, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in the year 70 by the Roman armies was a punishment by God given to the Jewish people for rejecting their own Messiah. In the second and third centuries, we have Christians who are saying that Jesus was God so that when Jews, they would say, when Jews are responsible for the death of Jesus, uh, we have some authors saying Jews are guilty of deicide. Jews have killed God, and God held them responsible. What's a scribe who thinks that going to do with his prayer of forgiveness? He's going to take it out, and that's exactly what happens. Some of our early manuscripts are missing the prayer. They're missing it because scribes have changed it for reasons of their own. These are some of the big differences uh, that you can find in the New Testament manuscripts. And there are all sorts of differences that you find. Some are related to theological disputes of early Christianity, where scribes have changed the text to make it coincide more closely with their own theological views. Some of these changes have to do with relationships of Christians and Jews. Some of these changes have to do with Christian understandings of women. Uh, there continue to be debates today in churches, Christian churches, about whether women should have leadership roles. Well, these, uh, these debates often hinge on verses that have been changed by scribes. You can guess which way scribes changed these verses. In the second and third centuries, when, when women's roles were being suppressed, uh, all of a sudden manuscripts start showing up in which women are told to be silent in the churches. Uh, this is a, the sort of change that, that uh, scribes made. The textual critic is somebody who tries to deal with this phenomenon of manuscripts that have so many changes in them. There are actually two things that a textual critic, critic does. One thing that is, uh, of course, primary importance is to figure out what an author actually wrote. Because you can't interpret an author, whether you're talking about Plato or Aristophanes or Homer or Mark or Matthew or Luke or John, you can't interpret what an author said unless you, you can't interpret what he said unless you know what he said. You've got to have his words and so textual critics try to reconstruct to the best of their ability what an author actually wrote. A textual critic also though is interested in knowing why the text got changed. Why did scribes change the text? I mean, you know, it's interesting to see that sometimes they fell asleep, but beyond that, what kind of theological motivations were there for changing the text? What kind of ideological influence was, were affecting these scribes? When we know more of that kind of information, we're better able to understand both the scribes and their own historical context as people living in the early centuries, especially the early centuries, a time period about which we have very little information about Christianity otherwise. Thank you very much. There are, there are microphones on uh, both sides, and uh, I think uh, we'll alternate. And uh, if, can I just say uh, that um, I will, if, if it doesn't sound like the question was loud enough, I'll, I'll repeat the question to make sure everybody, uh, everybody heard it. So, uh, yes, start over here. Yes, um, early in your conversation or in your, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, the Bible is often used in social situations, and you mentioned in particularly abortion, um, war and what was the other one gay rights have any of the differences that you have found or others have found affected how those um, concepts would be interpreted uh, did you all hear that yeah, yeah. Uh, the um, the kinds of social issues that are uh, pressing for uh, for us today were not pressing to the scribes who were copying the texts um, they, um, they simply had a whole different range of issues that they were far more concerned about. And so the passage that people leap on today to, to try and resolve certain kinds of issues uh, simply didn't have that kind of uh, importance to most of the scribes. So the answer is no, most of those passages weren't, weren't affected. 
Yes. Are you familiar with the book of Urantia? Um, I, uh, every time I give a talk, I have people ask me to, to read it, uh, but I, I, I d have not yet done so. Well, it's an interesting read because often there's uh, an expanded uh, uh, text on, uh, might be one line in the New Testament, and in your rancher there might be uh, three paragraphs. So yes. I, I commend it to you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, your comments on two other books, one of them the Gospel of Judas, and the other the Sword of Christian uh, Constantine. Also, I'm an airman. Really? How do you spell it? E-H-R-M-A-N. Oh, okay. Go for it. Um, yeah, okay. He's asking about two of the books, the, the uh, Gospel of Judas Iscariot. Uh, yeah, actually, let me tell, tell a story about the Gospel. Because I, uh, <laughs> I was, uh, when National Geographic was uh, considering uh, whether to finance the publication and dissemination of the Gospel of Judas, they called me and asked me if I would help them authenticate the manuscript, uh, which was my first uh, indication that National Geographic absolutely had no clue what they were doing with this, this manuscript because it's written in Coptic, which uh, which I can, I mean, I can read Coptic, but I'm not a Coptic scholar. Right? And so I told the, told the woman who had called me, I said, well, look, you need a Coptologist to do this. She said, she said oh, yeah, great. Okay, well, what's a Coptologist? <laughs> uh, a Coptologist is an expert in Coptic language who can, and I said, and she said, well, what we really want to do is date this manuscript. And I said, oh, well, to date the manuscript, then you need to get a paleographer. Uh, she said, oh, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. What, what's a paleographer? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then she said, well, really what we want, what we really want to do is carbon-14 date the manuscript. Are, are you able to help us with the carbon-14 dating? I said, yeah, right. Every Friday night, I carbon-14 date manuscripts. I said, no, I can't help you with carbon-14 dating. You need a scientist for that. I said, look, I'll find you a Coptic paleographer, and you find a scientist who can carbon-14. And, so, and they said, well, we, we want you to be involved with this, though, I, because, you know, we want somebody who's interested in early Christianity and knows about Gospels that didn't make it in. I said, no, I'm happy to be involved. I said, but uh, I said, where's the manuscript? She said, well, it's in Geneva. I said, okay, count me in. <laughs> And so, uh, so, we, so we went to Geneva. I, I, I have a friend, a guy named Stephen Emmel, teaches in Germany, who's a Coptic paleographer, and, uh, and uh, called him up. And I said, Stephen, I said, uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard these rumors, but the Gospel of Judas has turned up. And Emmel says, yeah. He says, you know what? I think I saw it 20 years ago. I said, oh, my God, you want to see it again? <laughs> he said, yeah. I said, okay, let's go to Geneva. <laughs> and so we did. So the Gospel of Judas is a, uh, it's the most recent discovery of an early Christian text. Uh, it was actually discovered 20 years, 20 years, 30 years ago now, 1978. But it, 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 uh, it's a very long story. It was, uh, it was unknown, basically, to everybody until uh, just, a, just three or four years ago. Uh, when it finally got uh, into the hands of competent uh, scholars and uh, a conservationist who could put it back together because it was it was fragmented in a ton of uh, thousand pieces um, but it 's a very interesting gospel because it 's a gospel um, that um, uh, is a gnostic gospel that talks about how uh, how how this world we live in is not the creation of the one true God, but is a creation of lower, inferior divinities. And the point of salvation is to escape this world. Okay, if, if you all know Gnosticism, I'm sorry, I'm taking a little longer on this than I should, but, but if you know the, the world of Gnosticism, the Gnostic Gospels, Gnostic, were, Gnostic Christians were people who felt like uh, they were entrapped in the bo their bodies in this world, that they were imprisoned in bodies. And, uh, and that because the creator of this world wasn't the one true God. It was a lower divinity. So the way I illustrate this with my students is, you know how, stu how sometimes people feel like they're alienated in this world? Like they just, they, they look around, and they, they just don't feel like they belong here. You know, they look around, and this world just doesn't make sense to them. I felt this way till the last election, actually. <laughs> so, so, yeah. I mean, I mean, I knew people that seemed to make, do just fine, <laughs> but it didn't make sense to me. I realized I don't belong here. <laughs> I'm from another, another world, and, and my, these friends of mine are not from another world. <laughs> they belong here. <laughs> and so uh, these Gnostics thought that they need to escape this world by having secret knowledge, and these Gnostic Gospels are, are Gospels that provide the secret knowledge. So the Gospel of Judas is that kind of thing. The most important discovery of a Christian book in the last 60 years, in my opinion.
Uh, the other question was about the, the Sword of Constantine written by James Carroll, which is, a, I think, a terrific book, a really good read, about um, basically about Jewish-Christian relations, uh, in short, but how, how, Jew, how the relationship of Christianity and Judaism changed when the Emperor Constantine became a Christian. Uh, I, I think that's a very, a very fine book. Yes. I was wondering if you would say a word about Marcion and also uh, if you would consider First Clement to be a first century witness to the text of First Corinthians. Oh, wow. I feel like I'm in my doctoral exam all of a sudden. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Marcion. Uh, the, sh the short on Marcion, Marcion was probably the most important Christian thinker of the second century. He was a, uh, a kind of a teacher philosopher type from, uh, from uh, Asia Minor who, uh, who took the Apostle Paul very seriously when Paul differentiated between the gospel of Christ and the, and the law of the Jews. Paul thought that a person could not be made right with God by, by keeping the requirements of the Jewish law, but a person had to have faith in Christ. And so this differentiation between law and gospel for Marcion became an absolute differentiation, that the God who gave the law could not be the God who, uh, who gave the gospel. So that Marcion taught that there were actually two different gods, that the God of the Old Testament was, in fact, a different God from the God of Jesus, that the God of Jesus, in fact, tried to save people from the condemnation of the God of the Jews. The idea is the God of the Jews created this world, gave Israel the law, everybody breaks this law, and so this Jewish God condemns them justly. I mean, they broke the law, so they're condemned. Jesus comes from a higher God who never had anything to do with this world before Jesus showed up. Jesus came to save people from the wrathful God of the Jews. Uh, and so Marcion tried to propound this point of view and, and won a lot of converts. In fact, in his day, he was extremely successful. Uh, there were a lot of Marcionite churches that started up. And in some parts of the Christian world, it looks like the, this Marcionite understanding of Christianity was the dominant form of Christianity. In this form of Christianity, the, the, Jew, the, the Christian Bible didn't have an Old Testament because that was, the, that was the book of the Jews. And it had, the, the Christian New Testament consisted of Paul's letters, Marcy knew of 10, 10 of Paul's letters, and one gospel, the gospel of Luke. So it was Luke and, and 10 letters. I mean, some of us are glad that Marcion didn't succeed because those of us who teach New Testament would only have half-time jobs now. Uh, so so, uh, so, so uh, anyway, so that, that was Marcion. The second question is, uh, does First Clement uh, give us any uh, attestation for the text of First Corinthians? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So First uh, Clement is a, is a book from, that is in a collection called the Apostolic Fathers. It was probably written in the mid-90s, and so it was actually written before some of the books of the New Testament. It was written to the church in Corinth by the Christians of Rome. And the deal, it was actually kind of an interesting situation that, that led to this letter. The, there apparently was this, some kind of ecclesiastical coup in Corinth where the leaders of the church had been ousted somehow or other. We don't know how. And some other people had taken over, and the people in Rome didn't like it. And they tried to, to reverse this, this coup that had happened. And so um, this author then is, or authors, is writing to the church in Corinth to try and straighten things out. And this author knows about 1 Corinthians and, in fact, reflects a lot of Paul's letter of 1 Corinthians, which was written about 30 years earlier. I, uh, I don't think it gives us any help for knowing the text of 1 Corinthians, if by that you mean, does it help us reconstruct what the actual words of 1 Corinthians were? I don't, I don't think it helps us with that, but it does reflect many of the themes that you find in 1 Corinthians. Yes. With the uh, possible exception of Matthew 24, where Jesus says, uh, oh, not even the Son knows, uh, none of the textual examples that you've given tonight pose any problem for fundamental Christian doctrines. And I'm wondering if there are textual examples that are more threatening on that front. My second question is, to what extent were canon and, um, and textual problems discussed at Nicaea? Okay, the second, the second question is quite easy. Uh, to what extent were canon, the formation of the canon of the New Testament and the text of the New Testament discussed at Nicaea? The answer is not at all. So, the, the, the Da Vinci Code says they were, so... Uh, uh, yes. Who, who do, so who, do, who should I believe? Yes. Right. Uh, I, I, think, I think you need to trust Dan Brown. He did a lot of research for this book. He learned, for example, that Leonardo's name was really Da Vinci. 
Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, the, according, according to the Da Vinci Code, of course, the Council of Nicaea is where there was a vote on whether Jesus was the Son of God or not, and uh, and it was actually a close vote. <laughs> and that, it's completely bogus. Everything he says about the Council of Nicaea is absolutely wrong. The Council of Nicaea didn't talk about the formation of the canon, which books would go in, which books would go out. Constantine had no role to play in that decision at all, nothing to do with it, uh, so far as we know. Uh, so I, So that's just... Uh, you know, that's something he came up with that, that is no, no bearing on historical reality, I think. Uh, are there textual changes that affect Christian doctrine? Well, it kind of depends how you look at things. There, are, there certainly are passages that affect Christian doctrine. There are passages in which Jesus, is, scribes changed passages to emphasize that Jesus was divine. They changed other passages to emphasize that he was human. And so they wanted to emphasize that he was both human and divine. And so they changed passages so that it would look that way. Uh, one passage in particular is kind of interesting that, that is directly related to Christian doctrine is that the doctrine of the Trinity is not explicitly taught in any passage of the Bible. In other words, the doctrine that there are three gods... Th no, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dan Brown speaking once more. Uh, the doctrine that there's one God manifest in three persons, that these three persons are each individually completely God, but there's only one God. Not three gods, but one God, but not one person, three persons. So the three in one. This is not taught in any passage of the Bible except 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, which, uh, in which the author says that there are three uh, witnesses in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. That's... That's, that's a pretty explicit statement about the, about the Trinity. Now, there's an interesting story about this passage because it doesn't show up in the Greek manuscripts of 1 John. It's in the Latin manuscripts of 1 John. When the first scholar to put together a, Greek, a printed Greek New Testament produced his work, this was Erasmus, who was a humanist from Rotterdam, uh, in the year 1516, he put together, the first, for the first time, the printed edition of the Greek New Testament. He didn't include the verse because it wasn't, in, it wasn't in the manuscripts that he had. And the uh, Latin theologians went, went ballistic. And ac according to the story that, that circulated, uh, Erasmus said, look, it's not in any of the Greek manuscripts. And they said, yes, but it's part of the church's doctrine. You've gotten rid of the Trinity. And, and, and Erasmus said, look, if you can produce a Greek manuscript that has it in it, I'll include it in my next edition. And so they produced a Greek manuscript. <laughs> And so they, they copied out a Greek, somebody copied out a Greek, and when they got to that point, they translated the Latin back into Greek, stuck it in, and Erasmus was true to his word, and included that in his next edition. And it was on the basis of that edition that the King James Bible translators put the Bible into English. So that's why the verse showed up in the King James translation. So yeah, that certainly affects, affects doctrine. Now, now the thing is, you could argue the, the doctrine of the Trinity without that verse. You can argue theology without any particular verse um, because that, you know, theology is never just kind of rooted in a particular word or a particular, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger thing than all that. And so my view is that, that Christian doctrine isn't based on any of these textual variations. What happens though is these textual variations sometimes change the way a, 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 a ver what a verse means. Sometimes they affect what an entire chunk of a book means. Sometimes these textual changes affect the very meaning of an entire book. And that's theologically significant to me. Not that it necessarily changes anybody's precious doctrines or their chosen doctrines, but it does affect what, what the books of the Bible mean, and that, that's theologically significant, I think. Yes. Yes, I appreciate your lecture. I haven't read Misquoting Jesus, but I enjoyed your Da Vinci Code book last year. It was, uh, got me thinking. Seriously, I, I did like it a lot. Um, a question I have uh, regarding the attempts to harmonize the crucifixion accounts, whether they can be harmonized or not. Um, concerns the logical approach that's appropriate to use, and this is what I'd ask your comment on. Um, Aristotelian logic uh, basically indicates that omission is not necessarily contradiction. Uh, at the uh, Stanford Philosophy website, I think it's the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, I forget exactly, there's a very elegant summary of Aristotle's definition of a contradiction. Basically, in my uh, limited style, I'll just say it's, it's uh, a situation where you have two uh, statements that cannot both be true at the same time regarding the same situation. The statement that Bart Ehrman and Bob Greger are in this room uh, does not contradict the statement that Bart is in this room. Uh, 
it does contradict the statement that only BART is in this room. So when you add the word only, that's a concern. And so um, given the fact that the, it, you know, the gospel writers were not attempting to be exhaustive, uh, it, 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 as long as Mark doesn't say the only thing Jesus said was Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, uh, I, I'm not sure that there's, a, uh, that there's an issue there. It's like if there was a, a traffic accident. One witness might say, well, the, the red car swerved and hit the pedestrian. Another person might say, well, actually, before that, it was a blue car that cut the red car off that I saw that hit the pedestrian. But, but there's not, they have different details, but that the test, the, the, the threshold for saying it's a contradiction seems to me to be higher than what you're setting it at. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, thank you. It's a very good question. And I think, you know, part of it, there, there are a couple things to say about it. One is, it depends what you're after. If you're after what each witness is saying, then it's not fair to make the one witness say what the other witness is saying, because they're saying different Absolutely. things. And so if you, what you're interested in is what the witness has to say, then you have to stick with what, what that witness has to say. Right. Uh, there are problems, there, there are problems of reconciling things. Because if, if you go with the idea that omission isn't a contradiction, you end up, the way you end up reconciling things leads to some very peculiar situations. For example, when I was in college, there, I bought a book. I was an evangelical Christian who, believe, who held this kind of view, and I, and I believed that, in fact, the text could all be reconciled with one another. And I bought a book that was called The Life of Christ in Stereo. Uh, which was, uh, the idea is, you know, it's kind of stereophonic sound with the Gospels, and you need them all going at the same time to get the full, full thing. And so, uh, and so, but, you know, there, there, are, there are problems, because in Mark's Gospel, Jesus tells Peter that uh, before the cock crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Now, Matthew's Gospel says before the cock crows, you'll deny me three times. So what do you do in the life of Christ in stereo? Well, you put the two together, and it ends up that Peter denies Jesus six times. Once before the cock crows, and once before it crows twice. Now that's perfectly possible, and it reconciles the difference, but it makes it, the text say something different from what any of the texts say. Uh, and as it turns out, there are flat-out contradictions too, which, which your way of doing it wouldn't, wouldn't work, in my, in my opinion. Just give you one example. Um, uh, the, well, I mean, one, one example is, well, no, never mind, okay. Uh, <laughs> What day did Jesus die on? Well, it depends which text you read. In Mark's gospel, it's quite explicit that Jesus has a Passover meal with his disciples. Mark 14, 12, where do you want us to prepare the Passover for you? Jesus tells them. They go home that night. They have the Passover meal. They eat the meal. After the meal, Jesus is arrested. He spends the night in jail. Next morning, appears before Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate kills him the morning after the Passover meal is eaten. You read the gospel of John. And Jesus has a meal with his disciples. It's not called a Passover meal. He's arrested after the meal, spends the night in jail, shows up for Pontius Pilate, he's condemned, and it says that he's, he is um, sent off to be crucified just after noon on the day of preparation for the Passover, which is the day before the Passover meal is eaten. So, uh, you know, he couldn't die both times. He either died the day before the Passover or the day after the Passover, but it couldn't be both. And so you have that kind of thing as well as the kind of thing you're pointing out where, you know, they might just be eyewitnesses telling different parts of the story, in, in my opinion. Just to clarify, though, using the Aristotelian definition of a contradiction, are the statements, the fact about what Jesus said from the cross, are those contradictory, those accounts? Or are they, see, I was saying you're omission just talking is... about the statements. No, no, but I'm or saying the, or, that if you, if you want to reconcile them by saying, that giving the seven last words of the dying Jesus, I mean, if all you're interested in is Aristotelian logic, then the answer is no. Okay. But if, if, what you're, if you're interested in what these texts mean, then the answer is yes. You get very different portrayals depending on which account you read. So okay. it depends what you're interested in. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was reading your book, Misquoting Jesus, today, and um, it actually made me think a lot of some feminist theory that I've been reading lately about... Um, uh, the responsibility of, of academics, Bell Hooks took a lot of flack for this book, Feminist Theory from Margins to Center. And so I'm reading Misquoting Jesus and thinking this is essentially a book about, with an argument about philology that is accessible, readable, and does not um, sacrifice the complexity of the argument. So one, is an inspiring, as an aspiring academic, what's your secret? And two, um, 
do you have a philosophy about what our responsibility as academics is and how do you think about what, who your audience is? Yes, thank you. Well, thank you for the compliment. And uh, yeah, you know, the reality is that most academics don't know how to talk to a normal human being. And so I have, you know, I have friends who want, you know, they want to write a book that, that would sell in Barnes and Noble. And I, you know, you have to tell them, you know, you're not writing this for the guy who's in the office next door. You're writing this for your mother. You know, you've got to think about, you know, who you, you need to learn how to communicate with people. And so there's not an easy, there's not an easy answer to that. But that was, that was absolutely the challenge of this book. Uh, what, one thing people have gotten upset about, well, evangelical scholars have gotten upset about this book is they say, well, this isn't news. We've known about this for hundreds of years, which is, of course, what I say in the book. We've known about this for hundreds of years. But there, so I'm not trying to present something that is like radically new that scholars have never known before. Scholars have known this since John Mill in 1707. And so this is, this is old news. But nobody's bothered to tell a general audience. Which is, you know, I mean, and the reason they haven't bothered is pretty obvious. It's hard. I mean, <laughs> we're talking about Greek manuscripts here. How do you talk about Greek manuscripts to people who don't read Greek? Right? Well, uh, you just have to figure out some way to do it. So, you know, the way I do is I, I like to tell stories. So uh, that, that's, that's how I decided to do it. So there's, I, you know, I don't think there's a real secret, secret other than just learning how to talk to people. So, yes. Actually, I have been reading the Bible for the last five years, and especially New Testament. There's one statement of Christ, be peace on him, which I want that you should explain it over. He says that I have been sent not to change the Torah. I have to come to fulfill it and act upon it in spirit and letter. And the only way to go to the heavens is if you follow Torah more than the rabbi. And then, if you read Torah, there's no mention about Son, Father, Holy Ghost. So when they were they created? If they were from the very beginning, why didn't any of the old prophets in the Old Testament mention about it? So I just want to get this clarified. Yes, thank you. Well, the, the passage you're quoting is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. It's distinctive to Matthew. Matthew's gospel is the one that emphasizes that Jesus' followers need to follow the Torah. Uh, it's interesting because the Apostle Paul says just the opposite. He says that a person can't be made right with God by following the Torah. And in Matthew, Jesus says his followers have to follow the Torah. And so, um, so that, that is an interesting issue. The, the question about what do you do about the fact that the Torah doesn't mention Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, of course, that, that's exercised theologians for centuries. Back when they were developing the doctrine of the, of the Trinity, they had, to, they had to deal with this. And they came up with solutions to that that by modern standards, I think, would be seen as creative. Um, um, you know, when, when God says, let us make man in our own image, who's he talking to? Right. Well, uh, so uh, so there are there are passages that in the Torah that were used to support uh, Christian the theology. But of course, uh, other people might say, well, the, these are interpretations of the passage that are not really the interpretations that they they would have had for their first readers. Yes. Is there someone over here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, can you talk just a little bit more about the relationship between these textual variants and different interpretations of the manuscripts with the actual process of canonization or deciding what should be put into the Christian canon and what should be omitted? The relationship between the, uh, the changes in the manuscripts and what, uh, what should go in and uh, what should go out. Yeah, were there like, you know, did that play into the debates of, you know, this gospel should be left out because we have different copies that are saying different things, for instance? Uh-huh. Yeah, actually, you know, that, that particular issue didn't come up very much uh, about, uh, you know, can, can this be in because this manuscript is cop has been changed in so many ways. Uh, there are interesting questions about the relationship of text and canon, though. I mean, just, just on kind of the most basic level, if the woman taken in adultery isn't in the oldest manuscripts, but it's in most of the manuscripts from the Middle Ages, is it part of the Bible or not? You know, is it part of the canon? Or the last 12 verses of Mark, it's, they're not in the earliest manuscripts of Mark, but they're in most of the manuscripts of Mark, so is it part of the Bible or not? 
And that, that really is a good question, and it's not a question that a historian can answer. It's a question that a theologian needs to answer, because it has to do not with historical fact, but with theological interpretation about the nature of Scripture. But it's really, a, I think it's a fundamental question for, uh, for theologians, because if the, theology, if, if a biblical theology is rooted on the t in the text, you have to know what the text is which is, for me, one of the reasons I've been surprised over the years that theologians show no interest in textual criticism at all, most of them. No knowledge of it, no interest in it. And it seems to me it's actually kind of important for, for biblical theologians anyway. So uh, I think you need to go to the mic if you have, you have a question. Did you have a question here? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for talk. Um, I have a question regarding the discrepancy <coughs> among the Gospels. Yes. Um, there are... Obviously, there are, there are many differences, and then uh, it can. It sounds like it's almost embarrassing to have uh, those four gospels put together as a Bible and um, say that you know this is truth, because there are obvious differences. Yes. Then uh, my point is uh, there are, there are argument about argument that um, if there are embarrassing uh, discrepancies among the Bible in the Bible. Why would early Christians and why would Christians, why would they put them together and they say it's the Bible, although, yes. although there are obvious differences? Yes, uh, it's a great question. Why, why, are there, why did the early Christians not look at these discrepancies and say this is a problem? Uh, why did they include them in the same, you know, in the same covers as, as the Bible? It's a, it's a really good question. And I think that actually different um, early Christians had different answers to that. One, one um, early Christian in the, in the second century was a guy named Tatian, whose answer to this was that you've got these four accounts. And this guy Tatian actually produced uh, a Life of Christ in stereo for, uh, for Syriac reading Christians in the second century. He, he took the four gospels and he put them together into one big gospel and, uh, and reconciled them all together with one another in a book that, he, that was called the Diatessaron, which means through the four. You take the four, and through the four, you get the big gospel. So that was one way of dealing with a problem. Some, some Christian authors thought that if you have contradictions between these texts, then what that is is the Holy Spirit telling you that you need to look for the deeper meaning of the text because the surface meaning of the text obviously doesn't work. And so it's, it's God telling you you need to look for the deeper meaning of the text. Uh, and the reality is that most Christians in the second, third centuries down to today never realize that there are differences. I mean, mo my, most people read the Bible and don't realize that there are differences. And I think it was that way in the early church, too. In fact, most of these people couldn't read anyway. So, I mean, it wasn't that they could do a careful analysis of the synoptic gospels. They couldn't, they couldn't read the gospel. So they heard them read in church, and they'd hear a story one week, and then another story next week, another story the next week, and it didn't occur to them that there are discrepancies. And so this idea of kind of finding these discrepancies in, in a way really wasn't the issue for most of these early Christians, I think. Uh, one more question. Uh, can you give the reference to uh, what just claimed about the illiteracy in the early Christianity? And, yes, the um, illiteracy of early Christianity. Just give me, yeah, can you just give me references? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the best study of literacy in the ancient world is uh, William Harris, and it's simply called Ancient Literacy, published by Harvard University Press. He doesn't deal very much with, Chris, with Christianity, but he does say a few things about it. All right, thank you. Yeah, I, I've come across a couple of radical pieces of information on in the Bible. I wonder if you'd comment on. Uh, one is that uh, this, I've read this in several places from biblical historians. One is that there was a get together at the, called the Second Council of Constantinople in around 555 A.D. And it was one where they did some major deletions in the Bible, and they took out just about everything Jesus said about reincarnation. That's, that's one of them. Uh, well, that one's easy. That's false. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the places I've I, uh, read this is in a book called The Jesus Mystery by Janet Bark. I don't know if that means anything to you. Right. Don't okay. read those books. Okay. <laughs> okay. And in, in all due respect, how are they wrong and you're right? <laughs> Authority. <laughs> <laughs> that's it? <laughs> uh, I mean... Uh, there, there are responsible historians, and there are people who are not responsible historians. And, and uh, as a, as, it's a very good question, actually, because how do you know the difference? You go to a bookstore, and you've got these books. I mean, you know, and they, 
some have nice covers and some don't have nice covers. How do you know? Who, and it's, it's actually not an easy thing and you have to know who to trust. And so one thing to do is look at credentials. Where do these people teach? Do they teach? Where did they get their degrees? Do they have degrees? Or are they uh, independent researchers? An independent researcher is somebody who doesn't have a degree usually. Why don't they have a degree? So they might be telling the truth, but where do they get their information from? Look at their footnotes and see if they tell you where they got their information from. And then read scholars who teach in reputable institutions, who have reputable degrees, and who, um, whose books go through the kind of vetting process that is typical in scholarship, which is that uh, you can't, you know, anybody can publish a book today, but, but scholarly presses publish books that have gone through a scholarly process by, of evaluation. And that's the, kind of, that's the kind of book you want to read if you want an authoritative account. Okay. Yeah, and the second piece of information was that there's 18 years that are missing from the Bible, basically from the age of 12 to the age of 30. And it's been said that that was deleted and that uh, he spent those years traveling through India and visiting with various holy men and so forth right. and reaching a state of enlightenment right, and right. then coming back to... Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, you know, you can even find gospels that claim that. These gospels were written in the 19th century, but I mean, you know, you can at least find gospels that say it. Um, there, there are 18 years that are unaccounted for, and the question is, what would Jesus have been doing during these 18 years? And uh, what most historians think is that he would have been doing what uh, any Jewish lad in uh, in a small hamlet in uh, Galilee would have been doing. He would have been working every day. Probably a carpenter, or the you know apprenticed as a carpenter, and he probably didn't travel. Jews, Jews. I mean, he, he was very poor. Uh, probably a hand-to-mouth existence, and uh, he probably worked six days a week. And on the seventh day, you couldn't go anywhere because it was the Sabbath. So uh, my guess is he just grew up in Nazareth. And uh, there, there's there there are no ancient sources. Uh, I mean. You know, ask, you ask me, how do I know this? I've read all of the ancient sources. There are no ancient sources that say anything about Jesus going to. India. Yeah, I, I just find, uh, given the stature of this man, that the fact that there was zero written about him in those 18 years is very suspicious to me. I just, I just think there must have been a deletion somewhere. <laughs> I mean, yeah. why didn't somewhere in the Bible it said, well, from the age of 12, he just spent the time with his father in his shop and doing this and that, and yeah. then all well, of a sudden emerged at 30 and did yeah. all these miraculous I, things. So, I, anyway. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, my question uh, concerns uh, essentially languages. If I understand correctly, and I'm not a biblical scholar, but I've done a little bit of work, uh, most of what is written uh, is from 30 years, the earliest would be some of the earlier letters of Paul, uh, to 60 and further on years later after Christ passed on, much of which is either in Greek or in Latin. Uh, and in spite of what the governor of Texas was purported to have said in about 1923 in a trial on bilingual languages, they had that same problem when she threw a Bible down and said, if English was good enough for Jesus, then it's good enough for our students. Um, I, I suspect that Jesus didn't speak English and actually spoke the language of the common people since he was actually trying to talk to the common people which, if I understand correctly, in first century Palestine was Aramaic. And there are very few Aramaic texts around. So could you comment on what's missing between what was actually said and the codices that we're actually trying to decode, uh, and with no reference to Da Vinci code here, uh, decode as being what he might have said. Yes. In fact, I don't believe he spoke English, so he did not no. say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. No. And in fact, I, I think the Neil Douglas Klotz and a bunch of others uh, in this Aramaic movement are trying to do something along these lines. So could you comment on that yeah. and where you stand there? Yeah, so, uh, no, it's absolutely right. Uh, Jesus spoke Aramaic. My, my opinion is that he did not know Greek, uh, and that he did not know Latin. I think he probably knew Aramaic. The Gospels are written in Greek, so already when you're reading the Gospels in Greek, you're a step removed from the, from the words of Jesus, assuming that the words that are being recorded are actually words that he said, because they're written 30 or 40 years later, and maybe some of these words weren't things that he actually said. There are sayings in the Gospels that make better sense if you retranslate them into Aramaic from Greek. Uh, I mean, it's tricky to do. I mean, it's, you know, but uh, you know, 
it's fun too. So I, uh, so give me give you an example. Um, there's a saying that doesn't make very good sense in Mark chapter two. Uh, I'll use the sexist phrasing of this because it's the one people are familiar with, and it's one that it's easier to make my point. Sabbath was made for man, not man for Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, sounds like familiar, but you know it doesn't make any sense. Man, Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. What's the therefore, therefore? <laughs> because it doesn't, doesn't work. Well, but if you say it in Aramaic, the word for man, meaning human being, and the word for Son of Man is the same word, Barnasha. Sabbath was made for Barnasha, not Barnasha for the Sabbath. Therefore, Barnasha is Lord of the Sabbath. That makes sense. So you retrovert it into Aramaic, and it, it adds up. And there are other sayings, just as a side. So, so you need to do that, actually, if you're doing the historical Jesus study. The other side of that is there are some things that cannot be retroverted back into Aramaic, which means Jesus probably didn't say them. I'll give you a famous example. Uh, every World Series behind home plate, you get a, somebody holding up a sign, you know, John 3.3, 3, you must be born again. This is a very interesting passage that uh, people holding these signs don't realize, uh, the uh, linguistic problems, <laughs> uh, which, are, which is this. Um, when Jesus says this in the Gospel of John, he says, uh, a person must be born anothen to see the kingdom of heaven. Anothen is a Greek word. Now, the word anothen is interesting because it actually has two meanings. It can mean from above or it can mean a second time. It means both things, and you have to decide which it means depending on the context. Nicodemus misunderstands what Jesus says. Jesus is saying you have to be born from heaven to see the kingdom of heaven, and Nicodemus thinks, I've got to go crawl back into my mother's womb and be born a second time? And then Jesus corrects his mistake. No, 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 and he, he tells him what, the, what, he, what he meant the first time. So the conversation hinges on the double entendre of, the, of this word anothen, the Greek word anothen. And you cannot reproduce the double entendre in Aramaic. <laughs> so the conversation hinges on a particular Greek word that doesn't have a doesn't have a parallel in Aramaic, which means the conversation couldn't have happened like that. Yeah, so, how about Hebrew? No Hebrew either. Yeah. yeah Hebrew either. Um, but they weren't speaking Hebrew in Jesus' day. They were Jesus probably could read Hebrew, I think. But but I, uh, they weren't. It wasn't a spoken language in in Palestine at his in his time. Yes. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is, <clears throat> how would you compare uh, the uh, copyists of the Sofarim uh, copyists uh, with those of the early Christians, which you've made uh, a great point on? The, uh, you're you're asking about Jew Jewish, Jewish scribes from the Middle Ages you're asking about? No, those are <clears throat> Masoretes. I'm talking about the, the uh, copyists in Ezra's time. Oh, the so for, yeah, yeah. We don't. Know. I don't think we know. Uh, what, you know what? What a lot of people say when I when I give a talk on on this about the New Testament is they point out that Jewish that what they say is well, Jewish practices were to copy everything meticulously, exactly. And they're they're usually thinking about the Masoretes. Uh, in the middle in the Middle Ages, Jew, there were Jewish practices that were extremely meticulous. But we don't. Uh, I don't think we know very much about copying practices in antiquity, uh, especially. Uh, in the, in the Persian period, because we just don't have the kind of evidence we need. Thank you. The second uh, question was, may I have your autograph? <laughs> uh, yes, you may. I'm going, to take, I'm going to take one more question, because this fellow, and then I'm going to stop. Yes. yes. Uh, in some of the ancient cultures, there were oral traditions that seemed to be uh, designed to preserve a certain um, passages orally very exactly. Is there any evidence from early Christian times that they're in some corner of Christendom such traditions were there, and what would they say about the uh, passages? Yes, uh, were oral traditions such that the uh, traditions were being kept intact over the over the years with the retelling. And there have been there have been New Testament scholars who've argued that Jesus was a rabbi who taught his disciples certain things, and they memorized these things. So they for uh, and and they passed them along without without changing them orally. Um, that. Um, that that idea has run 
ha has run into trouble on two, two grounds. One is that there have been anthropological studies of oral societies that have, that have shown that in, in, in most oral cultures, it actually doesn't work the way we would think it would work. Well, the way we think it would work is that if you can't write something down, that you'd probably want to remember it exactly because you don't have a way of writing it down, so you'd want to remember it exactly. But that idea that you would want to remember it exactly, in fact, is a product of written cultures. In oral societies, that isn't how they think, because they think, I mean, most people in oral cultures know that in, in an oral presentation, you change the story depending on the audience, the situation, the need at hand, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's that. The other thing is that there's a way to check whether the stories about Jesus were being passed along without changing or being changed orally. And that's the fact that we have several different authors who have written down the things Jesus allegedly said and did, and you can compare them with one another. And when you do that, there are discrepancies. So it looks like people are changing the stories, both orally and, and at the written stage, I think. Okay, I need to stop there. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you for an extraordinary evening. Thank you, Professor Ehrman, for bringing us a scholarship that we haven't known for 300 years, as you point out, since 1707, both here tonight uh, and in your books. And thank you all very much for your questions and for your participation this evening.